Hello students, welcome to lecture 7 of the online course on Photonic Crystals, Fundamentals and Applications. Today's lecture will be on symmetries for classification of EM modes. Here is the lecture outline, we will discuss about continuous translational symmetry, discrete translational symmetry, rotational symmetry, mirror symmetry and the separation of modes, time reversal symmetry and finally, we will summarize all these different symmetries that occur in any electromagnetic system. So, when we discuss about dielectric symmetry and mode categorization, okay, so why it is important? The symmetry in a dielectric structure serves as a convenient method for classifying electromagnetic modes within that system. So, we basically look for symmetry for mode classification. So, let us focus on the translational symmetries where both discrete and continuous translational symmetries will be explored with particular emphasis on their significance in the context of periodic dielectrics which is nothing but you know photonic crystals. We will then continue our discussion towards you know and beyond these translational symmetries and we will discuss about rotational, mirror, inversion and time reversal symmetries which will offer a comprehensive examination of how various symmetries could contribute towards the understanding of electromagnetic modes in any dielectric system. So, that way this particular lecture is very important. Now, what is symmetry? So, symmetry refers to a balanced and harmonious arrangement of parts or elements. Uh, when something has symmetry, it means that one part mirrors or corresponds to the other part in a way that creates a pleasing or balanced whole structure. So, in our everyday life, you may notice symmetries in things such as butterfly wings, snowflake, even on human face, okay, where one side is basically the mirror image of the other. In a broader context, if you discuss, symmetry plays a critical role in various scientific and mathematical um, principles uh, that helps us to understand and describe patterns and relationships in the world around us. Right? So, here you can see some pictures that uh, depicts the phenomena of symmetry. So, the lines that are drawn on this alphabets they tell you the symmetry plane. So, at, or on the two sides of the symmetry plane you can see that they are basically similar kind of features. Right? So, these are the two symmetry planes for the letter H whereas, for the letter U you can see only one vertical symmetry plane. Right? Similarly, if you divide different shapes something like a triangle, you can actually see that this is the symmetry line. For the heart symbol also this is the symmetry line. Whereas, if you have a diamond kind of a symbol, these are the two symmetry line. It has got horizontal, horizontal as well as vertical symmetry. Now, in electromagnetic modes, we, we are discussing um, symmetries today to describe electromagnetic modes. EM modes. Now, what is an e EM mode? So, EM mode basically describes the field pattern of the propagating wave. Okay? So, you can classify them as a free space mode as you can see here. Okay? So, electromagnetic modes can be thought of analogous to the normal modes of vibration in other systems something like in mechanical systems. Okay? So, here you can think of free space modes and what you have shown here is plane waves that is propagating uh, in vacuum or in any medium. So, here you can see that the electric uh, and the magnetic field. So, this is the blue one is the magnetic field, the electric field okay, is this one. They are basically orthogonal to each other and also to the direction of propagation. Right? So, these are the waves that exist in uh, free space. Uh, far from any antenna. There are also modes which are EM modes 
okay seen in the web guides and transmission line so the transverse modes okay are basically those where you know at least one of the electric or magnetic field entirely uh, lies in the transverse direction right so you can also have tem mode which are transverse electromagnetic modes where just like the plane wave both electric and magnetic fields are basically entirely transverse right so when we discuss about transverse electric mode it means that only electric field is field is entirely transverse okay so those can be also um, notated as h modes okay because it indicates that there could be a longitudinal uh, magnetic field component we can also think of tm modes transverse magnet mode magnetic modes so there the only the magnetic field is entirely transverse and they can be um, notated as e mode indicating that there is there are uh, there is a possible uh, longitudinal electric component then there are hybrid modes so hybrid electromagnetic modes can be named as hem or he modes okay as you can see here these are different hybrid modes so here what happens both electric and magnetic field components um, can lie along the longitudinal direction so they can be analyzed as uh, superposition of their corresponding t and tm modes okay so he modes are basically those where the electric or you can say the t component dominates and there could be eh modes okay where those are the hybrid modes where tm components dominate so you can also see modes in other uh, structures something like you know block modes which are seen so block modes are basically um, modes of block waves so you can see those occurring in periodically repeating structures so you can think of periodic potential and these represents the block theorem where u n k x is basically this and the envelope is given by e to the power i k x so this is block theorem and the periodic potential can be written as v x equals v x plus a so a is basically the period okay over which you know the potential is basically repeating now as you understand that em modes are basically distribution of uh, electromagnetic energy so you can actually take help of symmetries to classify different electromagnetic modes so in both classical mechanics and quantum mechanics the study of symmetry provides a powerful tool for making general statements about the behavior of the system and this principle can be extended to our electromagnetic system as well okay so the mathematical analogy could highlight the role of symmetry in understanding the property of electromagnetic systems so symmetry considerations um, become a valuable lens for interpreting and predicting system behavior so we'll take particular examples when we go to um, system by system okay so we can see that you know the exploration begins with very specific example highlighting the impact of symmetry on electromagnetic systems and this could serve as a practical illustration before delving into more formal discussion about symmetries in electromagnetism which could offer a structured approach to understand the importance of symmetry in this particular context so the two dimensional metal cavity that you can see uh, here okay possesses an arbitrary shape okay the shape is not a regular shape and it can be you know challenging to establish the precise boundary conditions and solving this particular problem analytically and that is where you know central symmetry could simplify your analysis so despite the complex shape the cavity exhibits an important symmetry which is called you know the inversion symmetry about the center so if you think of this is the center line you can appreciate this fact that this part and this part are basically looking similar just that this is inverted right so if the 
if this particular cavity is inverted, you can actually get the re remaining shape. So, this symmetry simplifies the analyzing analysis you know offering a key insight of the behavior of the electromagnetic modes within the cavity right so this is a two dimensional metallic cavity with inversion symmetry so when you look into red and blue these are basically representing positive and negative field so we are not discussing about which field so you can assume that these are basically magnetic fields okay positive and negative okay and um, in the top you can see a even mode actually occupied the cavity because whatever is the field here is similar here so you can write h r equals h minus r whereas in the bottom you can say that this is basically odd mode because you can say that h r is basically minus h minus r so that way you can identify that you know both these modes could have the same frequency omega but one is having you know uh, a symmetric uh, distribution another is having an asymmetric distribution so this inversion symmetry implies that if a particular mode pattern denoted by h r is identified with a frequency omega its symmetric counterpart which is h minus r okay that is this part will also have the same frequency of omega however this overall odd and even mode may have different frequency okay so now let us look into um, you know the modes with same frequencies okay those are basically called degenerate modes right so if a mode hr is not part of the degenerate family then its symmetric counterpart okay h minus r with the same frequency must be exactly identical okay so this would indicate that uh, h of minus r is basically a scalar okay multiplication uh, multiplied version of the actual field hr so you can say that you know depending on the type of symmetry whether it's a even or odd symmetry this alpha can be plus one or minus one now we have seen previous in the previous uh, slide that alpha equals one signifies uh, even modes which are invariant upon inversion and you can consider alpha equals minus one that characterizes an odd mode which is you know becomes opposite under inversion right so what happens if you invert the system twice so if you invert the system twice the system will return to its original function leading to the condition that alpha square hr is equal to hr right so that way you can do classification of non-degenerate modes so non-degenerate modes can be classified based on their response to the inversion symmetry so you can think of h minus r will be equal to h r and odd modes which are basically minus h of minus r to be equal to h r so this classification provides insights into how modes behave under the systems symmetry operations okay so this we have already discussed in the previous uh, slide right so moving to the next type of symmetry we will discuss about continuous translational symmetry okay so continuous translational symmetry okay so these these are those symmetry conditions where the system would remain unchanged when everything is translated by the same distance in a particular direction okay so you can think of translational operator td cap and system invariance something like this you put this translational operator to a system that is equivalent to and uh, you know all the function getting displaced by a displacement of d so you can write td epsilon r will be equal to epsilon r minus d which is same as epsilon r so that way 
it has got translational symmetry it means if you move your system by a distance d the same properties will repeat so you can consider um, you know td cap and theta cap to be zero okay so th this represents okay that it is uh, the system remains unchanged where theta cap represents the system operator right so you can see this particular um, comparison between quantum mechanics and electrodynamics where you can express the field or you know the potential as in this particular form in quantum mechanics and you can write magnetic field in a similar form in electrodynamics if you represent this as a eigenvalue problem you can see that you can write h psi equals e psi where you can see that theta cap h is omega by c whole square into h so this is also in the form of eigenvalue equation and what is this, this is basically maxwell's operator which we'll discuss more in more details in the next lecture right so you can actually find h cap as an hermitian operator and so is the theta cap or the maxwell's operator right so you can do classification of modes using translation so modes of the system can you know uh, be classified using their behavior under the translational operator td cap and the eigenfunctions of theta cap can be chosen um, to be the eigenfunctions of all these uh, td caps okay so leading to a z dependence which is the form of e to the power i k z where k is the wave vector so we discussed that eigenfunction of the translational operator that is td cap in z direction can be written like this so you apply uh, this operator translational operator on this uh, parameter e to the power i k z okay so that becomes e to the power i k z minus d so you have got this term okay so this times this so basically if you have one operator operating on e to the power i k z you get this particular eigenvalue and the parameter itself so e to the power minus i k d is basically an eigenvalue right so the modes of the system can be classified by the value of k which is the wave vector and uh, it indicates the z dependence of the functional form so it is the power i k z so if you consider an infinite system the k must be real which ensures that the modes are having you know bounded amplitude at infinity so if you consider a system with continuous translational symmetry in all three directions that actually becomes a homogeneous medium which can be characterized by a constant permittivity epsilon and typically it can be considered to be one for free space so how does the mode form looks like in homogeneous medium so if you consider modes in homogeneous medium so you can write h k r to be equal to h naught it is the power i k dot r what is h naught is kind of a constant vector so these modes are basically plane waves and their polarization aligns along the direction of h naught now if you impose the transversality requirement you can say k dot h naught will be equal to zero and that will further restrict you know the possible wave vectors so this particular condition will ensure that the plane waves satisfy the essential properties of the electromagnetic waves right so for plane waves okay you can start discussing with the uh, dispersion relation okay so this is the master equation so this is basically come from um, the maxwell's equation and this particular term omega by c whole square okay that can also um, give a you know if you apply this particular master equation okay 
So, you can find the plane waves which are basically h k r, they are the solutions of this uh, master equation okay? and this will be the eigenvalues. Right? So, omega by c whole square looks like the eigenvalue which is basically given by mod k square by epsilon. So, the omega and k relationship in this particular uh, medium with permittivity epsilon. Okay? So, that is the dispersion relation. So, what is that relation here? You can see it is omega equals c modulus of k by square root of epsilon. So, what is uh, omega? It is the angular frequency, c is the speed of light, k is modulus k is basically the wave number or you can say it is the magnitude of the wave vector and epsilon is the permittivity. Right? So, now we can classify by the wave vectors. So, we understood that the plane waves are classified by their wave vectors which specifies how the mode transforms under a continuous uh, translation operation. Also, the wave vector plays a crucial role in determining the direction and characteristics of the plane waves in the homogeneous medium. So, you can consider an infinite uh, plane of glass. So, this is a simple system with continuous translational symmetry, right? where the dielectric function varies only along the z direction. right? So, you can say E of r is basically or sorry, you can say epsilon r is basically epsilon z. So, along all other you know or you can say the azimuthal direction or azimuthal plane it is same. right? So, you can say the system is invariant under you know all translation operators of the x y plane. So, only it changes along the z direction. right? So, you can see this from the figure itself that the glass basically extends much further along x and y direction okay? and then in the z direction you can consider it to be you know of finite thickness. So, you can say epsilon r is basically varying only along the z direction and there is no dependence of the in plane coordinates which are like rho. It can be x or y, but there is no dependence. right? So, if now if you try to um, classify the modes okay, according to their in plane wave vector. So, in plane wave vector k can then be written as k x x cap plus k y y cap okay? and um, the x y dependence of the modes can be represented by complex exponential which is plane wave. So, you can write h k r to be equals to e to the power i k dot rho h z. Okay? So, the function h z that you see here which is basically dependent on k cannot be determined solely by this reasoning because the system lacks translational symmetry along the z direction. So, you have to impose the condition of transversality. Okay? That condition imposes a restriction on this function h. So, you can take k dot h will be equal to i dou h z by dou z. Now, if you apply the symmetry arguments, you can say you know the mode can be described by h k r e to the power i k dot rho h z. Okay? So, if you can if you then put non collinear neighboring points at the same z value okay, must be treated equally due to the symmetry. So, that actually sets the phase relation between the points and the effectively specifying k x and k y universally to this particular plane and along the z this particular restriction does not hold. So, it allows for different values of amplitude and phase. So, when you do the classification by wave vector k and band number n, okay, you can put each mode okay, using k and n and in case there is a uh, degeneracy, you can use additional uh, indices 
to distinguish those uh, degenerate modes which has got the same n and k values. So, here you can see a band structure which is basically dispersion relation. So, band structure is basically a plot of uh, wave vector versus uh, the frequency for that particular plane of glass. So, we are basically talking about the same system that we have seen here and this is the you know band structure or dispersion relation. So, here different uh, bands correspond to lines which rises uniformly in frequency as the band number increases right and this band structure provides insights into the allowed modes and their frequency in this particular system right. So, here couple of more uh, information is also available as you can see the frequency is basically a normalized frequency similarly the parallel wave vector is also normalized. So, this is done for a plane of glass of thickness A and the permittivity epsilon is taken to be 11.4 ok. So, this uh, blue lines correspond to modes which are localized inside the glass ok. You can see different uh, mode numbers over here ok and uh, you can see a red line ok that basically marks the light line. So, this is the line that uh, shows you the dispersion relation of omega equals c k right. So, the shaded blue region is basically a continuum states ok they extend into both glass and air around it, but here you have those discrete states ok. So, this particular plot shows you the modes with only one polarization here h is basically perpendicular to both z and k directions ok. So, with that we will now continue our discussion towards discrete translational symmetry. So, you can think of a figure of a grating like this ok. So, this dielectric uh, configuration has uh, discrete translational symmetry ok. So, this is one type of photonic crystal and this is very relevant to photonic crystals because photonic crystals also lack continuous translational symmetry, but they exhibit this uh, discrete translational symmetry right. And uh, because of this uh, discrete symmetry you can write you know epsilon r equals epsilon r plus minus a where a is that uh, periodicity ok. And uh, by repeating this translation you will you know so you, you will see that epsilon r is basically epsilon r plus capital R where that capital R is the integral multiple of this you know period A right. So, the repeated dielectric unit here you can see that the unit is basically um, highlighted using this box. So, you can call this as a unit cell ok which is repeated periodically when one dimension to form this entire structure right. So, here it is basically a x z slab of dielectric material which has got a width of uh, a in the y direction. So, that way you can define this right ok. So, this is what we discussed. So, r as I mentioned it is basically l a and l is any integer right. So, because of this translational symmetries ok theta cap must uh, commute with all translational operators in the x direction and uh, for lattice vectors that is capital R which is L A Y cap that lies along the y direction. Now, the modes of theta cap can be identified as simultaneous eigenfunctions of these translational operators which are typically represented by plane waves ok. So, you can see that uh, the operator on this e to the power i k x x ok you can 
put the translational thing so x can be written as x minus d so this term comes out as the eigen value okay and you get back this equation okay so same thing also happens when you use the lattice vector okay so you can be, because this is a continuous one here is a discrete one because r is only integral multiple of the lattice period so when you replace this equation okay dx by this r okay you can see that d will be replaced by la so it is a discrete you know step through which you are translating along the structure and you can see that this is how the discrete translational symmetry operation looks like we can begin to classify the modes by specifying you know kx ky okay as you see here however not all the values of ky will yield eigenvalues so let us consider two modes uh, one with wave vector of ky and another having wave vector of ky plus uh, 2 pi by a okay and if they form a degenerate uh, set with the same eigenvalue for this particular operation okay so we can say that ky and you know ky plus m 2 pi by a will be degenerate where m is basically integer okay so since any linear operation or you can say any linear combination of this degenerate with uh, Eigen functions yield modes in the form of this one. Okay, so we can take the linear combinations of our original modes to put them in the form below. Okay, this one. So you have h k x k y r. It is bar i k x x times it is bar i k y y, and then you can actually take linear combination of the degenerate eigenfunctions okay and you can represent any mode in this particular form so here you can see the expansion coefficient c can be determined through explicit solution however u y z is basically a periodic function in y and that satisfies this particular condition that u y plus l a and then that will be same as ui okay we are not talking about the you know z dependency here whatever is there it will be simply translated along y fine so the discrete periodicity in y leads to a y dependence for h okay that is um, simply the product of a plane wave with y periodic function something like this okay so we can think of it as a plane wave as it would be in free space but it is basically modulated by a periodic function because of the periodic lattice so this particular result is also known as block theorem okay and it is one of the fundamental concept in solid state physics and mechanics because it provides insight into the behavior of you know waves in periodic structure so what does it mean if a plane wave meets a periodic structure the waves amplitude will pick up the periodicity of the structure okay this is how you can explain this in simple words so now let us look into rotational symmetry so photonic crystals might have symmetries other than uh, discrete translations so a given crystal might have you know other symmetries something like rotational symmetry mirror reflection or inversion symmetry right so to begin we examine the conclusions that you can draw about the modes of a system with rotational symmetry so suppose an operator 3 by 3 matrix of curly r that stands for you know the rotational symmetry operator okay it, it is basically um, it's a rotation so there has to be an axis and there has to be an angle by which you are rotating 
so you can represent it, it as n cap comma alpha it means this operator rotates vectors by an angle alpha about n cap axis right so you can abbreviate this curly r n cap alpha by simply r curly r okay so that you know makes life easy for us and then if you want to rotate a vector field okay you take that vector f and rotate it with this curly r and you get f prime which is basically r f right so you can also rotate the argument which is the space okay so the you can write it as r prime which will be um, curly r inverse of r okay so if you put f prime r prime you can write it as curly r f r prime which can be written as f r inverse curly r inverse r okay it means you can define this as a vector field operator o curly r so this operator when it is operating on a vector field f r okay so this is the operation so curly r f curly r inverse times r so that is basically the operation on the argument so if the rotation r curly r leaves the system invariant so you can say the theta cap and this uh, operator okay will give you a zero right so by performing the manipulation something like this okay so you take the field h k n okay you uh, put this rotational operator okay and then you already have theta cap that is the maxwell's operator okay you can because these two can be interchanged and you can write it like this okay so this we already know from the master equation okay so what you are doing here the rotated mode which is basically this one as you can see satisfies the master's equation and what you have as your eigenvalue okay it is the same hkn right so you can see that it is an allowed mode with the same frequency so it had, it tells you that it is rotational symmetry so the state or cap hkn this can be identified as the block wave with wave vector rk okay proven by showing it is an eigen function of the translational operator tr with the eigen value of e to the power minus curly k dot r where r is the lattice vector okay so you can do the calculation of the eigen value so you can take tr which is a translational operator you are putting this on this operator okay so you can write you know rotational operator and then you can write t r inverse r okay hkn okay and finally by doing these steps you can say e to the power minus i r k dot r and then you particularly get this operator so what you see from here is that o r h k n this is the rotational operator operating on this particular field okay gives you the block state with the wave vector r k and it has got the same eigenvalue h k n so it basically follows this form that omega n r k is basically omega n k okay so the conclusion here is that when there is rotational symmetry in the lattice the frequency band exhibit additional redundancies within the Brillouin zone okay so this will be very important while analyzing photonic crystals okay where we will be using um, rotation mirror reflection inversion symmetry okay and you will see that the function omega n k exhibits symmetry 
and this set of symmetry operations like rotation, reflection and inversion is termed as point group of the crystal. Now, here you see a real lattice okay, and uh, this is a photonic crystal where you have a square lattice right? and this is the brilliant zone okay, which has got a origin marked as gamma and other two important points are marked as x and m. We will come to this one, this is the brilliant zone of the reciprocal lattice of this particular real lattice. So, we will come to the discussion of real and reciprocal lattice in the next uh, lecture. Okay? So, here we will look into a couple of important uh, factors that this one is called the irreducible brilliant zone, okay? but this triangular uh, wedge can actually uh, recreate the entire brilliant zone right? by using all those symmetry op operations that we understood. So, here there are three important points gamma, m and x. So, when you join the origin of the brilliant zone or the center of the brilliant zone okay, with the midpoint of the sides okay, that is x when you take it to the corners okay, or edges that is m. Okay. So, here when you discuss about the symmetry of frequency function, so the functions omega and k will exhibit full symmetry of the point group of the crystal and uh, because of that you do not need to consider you know for every k point in the entire brilliant zone rather you can only look for you know the smallest region within the brilliant zone where omega and k values are not related by symmetry so here all these uh, omega and k values will be uh, unique and you can only consider this particular range because once you know the information here, you can use the symmetry to recreate your entire reciprocal lattice, brilliant zone. So, for a photonic crystal with the symmetry uh, of a simple square lattice, you can see that the brilliant zone is uh, square. So, this is the brilliant zone okay, and it has got a center marked as you know gamma. And here you can see that the irreducible brilliant zone is basically only one eighth of the area of the full brilliant zone. So, this remaining portion is basically uh, redundant copies of this irreducible brilliant zone. So, how does it help? So, when you want to compute the band structure of your photonic crystal, if you are able to identify the irreducible brilliant zone and only compute the band structure for this one. As you know, the remaining brilliant zone is basically redundant copies. So, you can use those symmetries and recreate the band gap for the entire crystal okay, or the brilliant zone. Okay. So, now let us look into another important symmetry which is mirror symmetry. So, mirror reflection symmetry in a photonic crystal is notable for its ability to separate the eigenvalue for theta cap into two distinct equation, each for is particular polarization. Okay? So, we can do polarization separation something like you know under mirror reflection symmetry the conditions arise the conditions that arise okay, will allow the separation of modes where in one case h k is basically per perpendicular to the mirror plane and e k is parallel and in the other case it is reverse that h k is uh, in the plane and E k is perpendicular. Okay? So, this simple um, approach or the, you can say the simplification is advantageous as it provides immediate information about the mode symmetries and it facilitates uh, numerical calculation of their frequency. So, if you again consider this uh, system which is basically a dielectric configuration with discrete translational symmetry. Okay? So, what is this structure? This is basically a notched dielectric. Right? 
So, this is invariant under mirror reflection along you know y z. So, if you cut it like this, if you put a mirror along y z or you put like this you know x z plane, you can actually see mirror symmetry. So, you can name a operator like O m x that is the mirror reflection operator. So, once you define that operator corresponding to reflections in the y z plane. Okay? So, what you can write it this this particular operator will reflect the vector field okay, using m x on both its input and output. So, you can write o m x f r. So, f r is the vector field. So, you can see it is basically reflecting the vector field. So, you have m x f operating on m x r. Okay? So, how do you find out the eigenvalue? So, you can see that this can be either plus 1 or minus 1. So, the two uh, possible eigenvalues of this uh, mirror reflection operator can be plus 1 or minus 1. So, that represents the representation or sorry restoration of the original state after two reflection of the mirror reflection operator. right? So, due to the system symmetry OMX will commute with uh, theta cap. So, you can write this equals 0. Okay. So, now if you operate on H k with the commutator which is demonstrated as you know O m x H k. Now, this will correspond to the block mode that will have reflected wave vector of m x k. So, it can be written like this. So, O m x H cap H k is basically e to the power i theta h m x k. So, what is e to the power minus i phi? So, not theta phi. So, here phi is basically arbitrary phase. Okay? So, this arbitrary phase in this relation does not impose significant restrictions on the reflection properties of h k unless k is aligned in such a way that you know m x k turns out to be k. So, what happens when m x k is basically k, the equation that you see here okay, becomes an eigenvalue problem and h k then must satisfy this particular condition that this uh, symmetry of mirror symmetry operator working on this should give you plus minus 1 and this field itself. Okay? So, you can write m x k and m x r is the argument. The electric field E k can also follow similar equation resulting in both electric and magnetic fields to be either even or odd under this mirror symmetry operation. Fine. So, since m x r equals r within dielectric, okay. so considering the transformation properties of the electric and magnetic fields okay, and the only non-zero component for um, o m x even mode are basically h x e y and e z while you consider the rotational symmetry odd modes you can only see that those can be described by e x h y and h z. So, in general the separation of polarization is possible under specific conditions. So, this is the condition that you know m k equals k for a reflection m such that you know these two will commute, commute it. So, you have theta k and theta m giving you this 0. So, what are the applicability of this to two dimensional photonic crystals? So, in the case of two dimensional photon crystal, these conditions can always be met. These crystals are periodic in a plane, but uh, uniform along the axis perpendicular to that plane. Right? So, you can consider symmetry operations something like you know 
uh, z cap can be replaced by minus z cap. So, if you do this operation, this is basically a symmetry for any origin choice of the 2D crystals, right? And we also understood that you know in two dimension or you can say every two dimensional photonic crystal can classify its two distinct polarization. So, either it can be even modes which are represented by E x, E y and H z or it, they can be odd modes represented by H x, H y and E z. Okay? So, how do you define the transverse electric T and transverse magnetic modes in this case? So, in the case where the electric field is basically confined to the x y plane, okay, we can call it a transverse electric or T modes and the latter okay, where the magnetic field is confined to x y plane, you can call it as transverse magnetic mode. So, what is it x y plane? You can go back and see here. Okay. Let us go back to the structure quickly. x y plane you can see this one. Okay. So, we will discuss the last important symmetry which is time reversal symmetry. So, time reversal symmetry is a globally significant symmetry in the context of electromagnetic systems. So, if you take a complex conjugate of the master equation for theta cap, okay. so this is the master equation and here you note that these eigenvalues will be uh, real for uh, lossless materials. Now, if you take complex conjugate of the master equation, okay, when uh, the eigenvalues are real, okay, you will get something like this. Okay, you are taking uh, complex conjugate and uh, the eigenvalues are real, so they only apply on the function. And through this manipulation, HKN conjugate satisfies the same equation of HKN with the same eigenvalue, right? So you can say if you write h k r equals e to the power i k r u k r. Okay? So, it is evident that h k n conjugate will also make a block state where you know at minus k. So, you can say that this manipulation the consequence of this manipulation is the relationship this one omega n k can be written as omega n minus k and uh, this holds for all the photonic crystals. Okay? So, what do you see that the frequency bands exhibit inversion symmetry even when the crystal itself does not possess inversion symmetry. So, this is something very important okay? and that will help us in calculating the band structure very quickly. So, taking the complex conjugate of H k n is equivalent to reversing the sign of uh, time in the Maxwell's equation. Okay? So, the equations remain like this okay? and this particular relation omega n k can be written as omega n minus k. This can be considered as time reversal symmetry inherent in the Maxwell's equation. right? So, that is the consequence of the time reversal symmetry. Now, here you can see um, a comparison between quantum mechanics and electrodynamics. So, when we talk about discrete translational symmetry, you can see this is how it happened in uh, periodic potential in quantum mechanics and uh, for photonic crystals, you can say you can write epsilon r equals epsilon r plus capital R. This is the commutation relations okay, for Hermitian with uh, commute with the translational operator. Here, the Maxwell's operator uh, commutes with the translational operator, and this is the block theorem. right? So, what you see here is that com a comparison of the system containing an electron which propagates uh, in a periodic potential right that is what is the system considered in quantum mechanics 
and then you are comparing that with the system of electromagnetic modes in uh, photonic crystal. So, in both the cases as you can see here the systems have uh, translational symmetry in quantum mechanics the potential V r is periodic and in electromagnetic case the dielectric function epsilon r is periodic. This periodicity implies that the discrete translational operator commutes with the major differential operator of the problem whether it is the Hamiltonian in one case and Maxwell's operator in the other case. right? So, we can index the eigenstates as psi k n or you can write h k n okay, using the translation operator eigenvalues and this can be leveled in terms of the wave vectors okay, and bands in the brillouin zone. So, all of the eigenstates can be cast in block form which is basically a periodic function modulated by a plane wave. right? So, the field can propagate through the crystal in a coherent matter such as block wave and the understanding of block wave for electrons explained one of the greatest mysteries of 19th century physics. It is like why do electrons behave like uh, free particles in many examples of conducting crystals. So, in a similar way a photonic crystal could provide a synthetic medium in which light can propagate, but in ways which are quite different from light propagation in a homogeneous medium. So, that is why this particular you now you can think of the similarity shown between you know quantum mechanics and uh, electrodynamics in periodic medium here. So, with that we will come to an end to this lecture we will discuss about you know uh, we have discussed all about the symmetries uh, for classification of EM modes and if you have got any query on this particular lecture you can drop an email to this particular email address. Thank you. Thank you.